It's Congress Great the Visual Storytelling Show, recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org. Right on the corner of 5th and William. Uh, my name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and this is the show where we talk about visual storytelling, comics illustration, comics lifestyle. Uh, anybody who's ever been remotely curious about what goes into making visual storytelling with drawings and illustrations and designs, or uh, what kind of what what it's like to be a cartoonist, uh, this is the show for you. And I am joined today by uh, somebody who I'm very excited to talk to, uh, Mr. Dan Santat of uh, D. Oh wait a minute! Oh, I gotta get your your URL right. Uh, it is dantat.com. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, oh man, let's go down your credits. Uh, man, this is gonna. I'm I'm gonna blast through this because there are a lot of credits here. I mean, it's just not me. No. <laughs> just just what you got coming out in 2012 is is ridiculous. Uh, I'm wondering. I, I will agree to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing. Are you doing all of these books in 2012 this year? Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm pleased to say that um, I, I've, I've managed to keep my family well fed for the year, and uh, most importantly, I, I'm really happy with the quality of the work that came out. Um, you know what? It started out where um, I was getting some jobs, and sometimes you know when you get a freelance job. Uh, offered to you, you take it because you know it's the next job you do because you have to eat. And then uh, I ended up, I ended up winning an award at the Society of Illustrators. And then, and then the phone started to ring, and I started getting these really nice projects that I really couldn't say no to. Um, so two projects turned into four, which turned into. S- God, 2012. I have seven books coming out. Yeah, it's... I was wondering. Uh, we can we can name these books. So you're you're. Uh, we should say you're a cartoonist. You're a graphic novelist. You've worked in the animation yes. industry. You created the replacements on the Disney Channel. Yeah. Um, your your book from Scholastic. Your uh, graphic novel is Sidekicks, which we'll talk a little bit about in a second. But I want. I'm wondering if we can kick over to the video. Uh, Matt and the guys in the production room. If you can kick <coughs> over to the video while we talk about uh, all of the books you got coming out in 2012. This is absurd. How many books are coming out? So. Uh, want to start naming them and telling us about them while we? Oh gosh, let's see. I have this is the three ninja pigs, written yeah. by an author uh, Corey Rosen Schwartz. This comes out from uh, Putnam Books in October. Um, this is a galley for a book called Oh No, Not Again. I did a picture book last year called Oh No or How My Science Project Destroyed the World. It was written by Mac Barnett. Uh, this comes out. I want to say June. Um, oh, are we looking at a pre-production slick? Yeah, this is like a this is what they call a, a F and G, a fold and gather. And then uh, this is one that comes out uh, in April or May, I think. It's called Dog in Charge, uh, written by uh, KL Going, who's a uh, she's a YA author, and this is her first picture book. Uh, I have this book coming out in a couple weeks. It's called Bach and Roll. It's a sequel to. Um, a book that I had had done back in 2007 called Chicken Dance. Uh, I have others. I'm working on a book right now with Amit uh, um, Zappa. Uh, I'm I'm working on another book, um, The Guys Read Anthology, which is uh, edited by John Sheska. For those of you who uh, are familiar with the Stinky Cheese Man. Um, what else do I have? Oh, I have a great. There's a great book that I'm that I just finished. Written by Michael Buckley for uh, those of you who are familiar with the Sisters Grimm series. Uh, he did a picture book called uh, Kel Gilligan's Daredevil Stunt Show. And it's, I, I don't, I don't want to say that any particular is my favorite, but this one's probably the funniest one of the year. And it's just about a kid who uh, he, just takes, he just takes the ordinary aspects of his life. And turns them into these huge events, like you know. He says, "Oh, for my next trick, I will, I will eat broccoli." And <laughs> the whole family just says, "Oh my gosh!" Go. <laughs> um, uh, other books let's for see, a little uh, kid that is a daring thing, you know. Exactly. exactly. And so, let's see. Uh, what else do I have? I have another. I have another one called uh, "Fire Fuego, Brave Bomberos." And yeah, there's a video a, where that, that's right on your main main page. When you go to the website, you can watch a, a trailer for it. Uh, there's another chapter series called um, Nanny Piggins and the Wicked Plan, which is a sequel to The Adventures of Nanny Piggins by Rachel Spratt. Um, 
So, I, so in other words, in other words, uh, you are working all the time. You are always, always working. I am. I am. I so, am. And you know, that's. It makes me feel comfortable knowing that I'm always working. Well, yeah, that's a good problem to have, right? I mean, it's like economy, whatever. Uh, look, look, look at what Dan's doing. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about sidekicks now. Uh, Matt in the control room. I'm hoping can can we queue up the video for the sidekicks uh, trailer while we talk about it a little bit? Okay. Okay, so uh, so sidekicks. This is a graphic novel, and and this is where I want to say to people who are watching, anybody who's an Avengers fan, uh, if you're gonna take your kids to see the Avengers this summer, then right afterwards, what you should do is take the kid and go pick up a copy of Sidekicks. Because what Sidekicks about, Dan? Uh, sidekicks is about a superhero named Captain Amazing who uh, has fi fought crime in the city of Metro City for years, and uh, it's one of these cases where this superhero is so busy fighting you know, protecting the city, that he, he never really had the opportunity to start a family of his own. Uh, and so he, he kind of fills this void by adopting pets. And uh, the story revolves around these uh, neglected pets who are always at home, hoping to spend some quality time with him. Uh, Captain Amazing, uh, his weakness uh, is that he is allergic to peanuts. And so early on, he... Uh, he gets knocked into a peanut stand, and he uh, he has to he has to retire from crime fighting for a month until his body heals. And at his old age, he realizes he needs to audition for a new sidekick to help him fight crime. And so these pets who ha have lived at home with him all these years, they all decide that they should all audition for this sidekick job, so that if one of them gets to the job, they can spend more quality time with him. And pretty much declare themselves a favorite house pet of the house. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's a bunch of really awesome characters in this. You've got uh, Fluffy, the All American Hamster, mm -hmm. and Shifty, uh, aka the Chameleon, Manny, Static Cat, and uh, Roscoe, uh, aka Metal Mutt. Uh, so this is this is a, published by Scholastic. It's a <laughs> uh, great graphic novel for kids, and I mean, I think it's awesome that it's coming out now when the Avengers is coming out, because it's a perfect time. Or, well, you yeah. know, it's been out for a while now, right? right? Mm -hmm. but, yes, yeah. But you can go get it uh, right after seeing all the, the superhero blockbuster films, and then... Because, you know what? This is this is where I'm, I'm talking to now to the dad who says that my son's... Or I'm a Captain America man. My son's gonna be a Captain America man. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, <laughs> in the 80s, we had new characters coming out, like Blue Devil, Booster Gold, and it was really awesome that I got to talk to my dad, who was just Justice League fan about mm -hmm. how oh yeah Booster Gold's like my hero who got yeah. who gets to interact with Green Lantern who is your hero old man uh, so yeah. Sidekicks is for the next generation right we could yeah say it's it's funny someone had pointed out to me um, it was his, it was his parent and I don't know if this was a compliment or you know a piece of advice but you know he was making referrals to comics like uh, Jared Krasowska's Lunch Lady um, you know Baby Mouse from Jenny Holm and Matt Holm. Yeah, uh, and how that's for like a younger that's for a younger audience, and then the next progression would be you know, uh, graphic novels like um, like the the Amulet series by Kazuki Buishi, mm -hmm. uh, you know Missile Mouse, Jake Parker, yeah, and you know I got uh, the dad said you know you kind of fall in between there you know like it, it's it's like the little step from Baby Mouse and then to Sidekicks and then to Amulet. And his advice to me was, you should age it up so that it's, it's up there with Amulet, because that's where like, all the kids jump to next. And when you go to the bookstore, it's not... I, I didn't quite understand, because when I go to a bookstore, graphic novels are just with graphic novels. But he said, oh yeah, when I went to the kids section, you know, Sidekicks was nowhere to be found with all the other graphic novels. And I thought, why would it not be Weird. with other graphic novels? Huh. Oh, I don't know, but you know, uh, it's one of those stories I didn't... I didn't consciously write for a specific age group it just happened to to fall that way and i think i think that's the way i do it with all my graphic novels i just want to make sure the story doesn't suck a mutual friend of ours dave roman uh once said teen boat teen boat yep wearing the teen boat shirt today uh everybody should go out and get teen boat uh next month uh and that's at teenboatcomics.com by the way uh, he once said to me something that really stuck with me. Uh, I was talking to him about uh, a plan for a comics project that I wanted to do, and I was going into, I'm going to do this with marketing, I'm going to do that with marketing. And he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. He's like, you do know your first priority is to make a good comic, right? 
I'm like, oh yeah, you know, we can sometimes distract ourselves from actually just committing to a good book that makes us happy because that's where that's what's really important is that love has to show before anything else, and then you can figure yeah. all that other stuff out in the back end. Um, I, I really do think that Dave should, uh, you know. Uh, rent out his time as a comics therapist. He could be like the Dr. Katz of, of the comics industry if he really I'd wanted to. his own little web show. Yeah. <laughs> nice oh, talk. man. Like, your deal. I would stop doing this. I would. I, there's no need for to do a, a comics talk show anymore if Dave was doing this. I'd back off gracefully and, and gratefully. I'd be, ah, finally, I can watch something. But... Uh, Okay, so okay, we'll get, we'll talk more about your projects. I'm sure as we cover this topic today. So we're going to talk about fear, courage. Yes. We're going to talk about this thing that um, I'm going to try to frame this discussion before we dive into it. Uh, you know, how many times have you heard this, Dan? Somebody comes up to you like, "Oh, you draw books and children's books for a living and comic books. That <laughs> sounds like fun. That sounds like you you must be the every day must be like Willy Wonka's house uh, at, at your place, right?" And then. You give them a pencil and say, draw me something. Like, oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Right? It's like, I can't draw a stick figure. I can't draw a straight line. We've heard that a million times. So the normals admit that it's scary to do what we do, even though on the surface they think it's fun. Uh, and then even even like people who are standing on the outside who want in, uh, you know, it's like once you get in, then it's like you got to keep the gigs going. Like you're talking about all this hard work you're doing this year. Uh, and and you get, you're always uh, running after the next hunting for the next gig, you know, trying not to starve. Uh, so it's a scary business. It's natural that we'd feel fear. But then on top of it all, you are expressing stuff. We just talked a second ago about how uh, it's, it, you should make something that you love doing. You should make a story that you're genuinely excited about. In other words, you're revealing something about yourself, and revealing something about yourself is a scary business and sharing it with the world. Uh, so how do you... Uh, it's inevitable that you're going to be frightened from time to time, and how do you cope with that? Um, now you're roughly the same age as me, so I'm going to do. A, 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 you know, people are going to groan who've watched this show a lot, but I'm going to quote He-Man again. Uh, there was a He-Man episode, and this is another thing. Like, you don't even need to watch the show; just go watch He-Man, uh, the first the first season, and and just pay attention to it because there's a lot of uh, smart stuff in there where he says, you know, courage is not uh, the absence of fear, but doing the right thing. Despite being afraid, right? You know, <laughs> they, should, they should have like one of those He-Man memes, like the Ryan Gosling ones. Hey, girl! <laughs> <laughs> but it's but it's He-Man passing on really yeah, smart stuff that'll carry through you with carry through the rest of your life. But anyway, yeah. so what inspired this topic? What got me really excited about talking about this topic in particular was you wrote a blog post last December <laughs> on your blog uh, uh, dantat.com. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could walk us through that story. You, you did a review of, like, you looked at the last 10 years of your life and kind of did an assessment, and you had some observations that I thought were really, really uh, insightful. Yeah, it, I think it, it starts from uh, just when I was a kid growing up. My parents, my father was a doctor, and, um, you know, I, I you know, had this relatively, I mean, as, as Asian parents go, they were they were relatively, you know, fair and not so strict, but the one thing that they really wanted me to do was be a doctor. And, um, you know, my dad used to pray to Buddhist monks and stuff like, oh, I want him to be a doctor. Uh, never let me take any art classes because they, they didn't want me to be discouraged or they didn't want me to lose that focus of one day growing up and, you know, being a psychiatrist or something. And so all my life, like up to the age, up till, you know, high school, I just thought, okay, well, the next logical step will be going to college, then getting a four-year degree, then probably going to medical school and um, becoming a doctor. And, you know, it, it's, it's not that my parents ever said, no, you will never be an artist, but it was, why don't you be a doctor and then you can do art as a hobby, and if that works out, then you can be an artist, but it's more important that you find security for yourself. Um, so it was just hardwired in my brain, like all my life, to just take that safe path and not take any, you know, not take any risks because, you know, this is a tough competitive world and you want to make sure that you can, <laughs> you can last in it. And my parents always felt, my, my parents always felt, if if you make lots of money, then money will bring you happiness. And I thought, okay. So you know, I went to I went to uh, UC San Diego, and uh, you know, I, I I was an awful, awful biology student. Um, 
Like I would, I would take a class on the cell and we take notes on the cell. We draw the parts of the cell. I remember my friend would look at my, my notebook and say, that is an amazing picture of a cell. <laughs> your, your notes are horrible. <laughs> you know, oh, check out this, check out this mitochondria. Um, <laughs> I saw his mitochondria and I cried. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was it was funny because it was it was all my friends in art school. I mean, it was all my friends in college that kind of discouraged me from going to art school. They said, you know, like why why are you doing biology? You should be doing art. And again, I could hear myself kind of saying the same things my parents said, like, well, you know, I need to do this cure thing. I'm gonna do art as a hobby. If that works out, then I'll move on to art. And, you know my friends just, they were really pushing me. They said, you're insane. You should just do this. You're awesome at it. You do it in your spare time. Um, and, you know, some of my biggest influences in my life were, you know, I was reading comics all the time. I was playing, you know, video games, huge, like, LucasArts graphic adventure fan. And I thought, you know, making making video games would probably be fun. Making, you know, uh, being an animator or something would be fun. And it was around this time when Lion King and all these uh, all these movies were coming out and, like, CG technology was becoming... They had, like, this golden age. Like, oh, if you can learn how to use a computer and draw on it, you will make hundreds and thousands I of dollars. I remember those. I remember those Diploma Mill commercials. Exactly. Oh, man. Look, they would they would literally show guys, like, it'd be like, a, get a graphics design degree, uh, graphics design degree, and look at all the money that you get to make. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're and like, look at this helicopter. It's like... <laughs> With like a triangle on top, kind of just like turning. Yeah. You're like, oh, I, I'm making eighty thousand dollars now. You know, degree in web design. And I think uh, it wasn't so much. I wasn't so much excited about making lots of money, but I, I I looked at it as an opportunity, as an excuse to tell my parents, look, I can do this, and you can make lots of money doing this, not knowing what kind of jobs were out there. You know. It's funny because when you think about growing up as an artist, I never got any exposure to what you could actually do. And so uh, my senior year of college, I had already applied to dental school. Um, and I, basically, I just had to finish out my year. So I had my last, I had my last quarter as a senior, and then I was, I was, I was done. I was going to graduate. And I was late for a class, and I went through a job fair. And there was a booth for the Academy of Art in San Francisco, and I looked at the catalog, and it's 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 bizarre how you know you don't realize the impact that art has in the world without someone spelling it out for you. So you looked at the catalog, and you say, "Oh, I can do record albums, I can do video games, I can do calendars, I can do you know children's books." And again, like I said, animation was a big thing, and I thought, you know what, I would really regret not trying to get into an art school. Like if I was going to go off into dental school and not even give art a shot, I would really regret it. And I remember one of the things about dental school was uh, a friend of mine had said, uh, he, was, he was at the USC dental school and he said, the first thing they make you do is grab a bar of soap and you have to carve it into a tooth. And I remember I was so excited. <laughs> Like I went out and I bought like, you know, like five bars of zest and I was like, I'm going to make the best teeth ever, you know, I have this row of green teeth, you know, and I was standing there with like a knife. I'm like standing there with a knife and a bar of soap thinking, why am I doing this? Like, I mean, after, you know, after I'm done carving these soap teeth, I'm actually going to have to look at people's mouths. <laughs> That's true. If you're gonna spend the rest, yeah. I mean, and the, I just went to the dentist. God bless him. I am so glad that people want to do that, but I don't want to have my fingers in other people's mouths. I got, I got, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, it was never my, it was never my intention to be a doctor. It was just kind of this thing where I thought, you know, I have to please my parents. I have to, I have to make them proud. I have to do make, you know, I have to do these things that they want me to do because I feel like I owe it to them. You know, like they paid for college, they raised me. Um, and I don't know if it's like an Asian thing or or whatever, but you know, I, I definitely was one of those kids that grew up and just fell in line with everything my parents said. You know, I drank that parental punch of, you know, oh, well, I will find a girlfriend and if my mother approves, I can marry her. And I thought <laughs> <laughs> So um really it was like I went to college and I hung out with all these people and, you know, I realized, hey, this is 
this um, this path I'm taking really sucks, and it's really nice to be able to make my own decisions, you know. Yeah. And uh, and so I, you know, the the last ten week quarter, I ran all over San Diego just looking for figure drawing classes and just you know trying to put a portfolio together. And in ten weeks, you know, I had a bunch of figure drawings and a bunch of things that I that I that I drew. And, you know, the main way I learned was um, I taught myself to draw by just copying comic books. Um, and uh, Wait, you know, got- wait a second. I hear it on good authority because I go on Tumblr sometimes and DeviantArt, and I hear that copying is a bad thing to do. That That is not a good way to learn. It's funny. You go to art school, and the first thing that they make you do is to copy, to copy the master's originals. They, you know, like... Oh, today we're going to take this NC Wyeth painting, and I want you guys to copy it stroke for stroke. Yeah, and it's amazing. It's like walking in an artist's footsteps, and you learn from everything. So, so yes, no, copying, copying is good. But, but what what I'm hearing from you is is that it sounds like you're a pretty driven guy. You know, you took you. There was nobody pushing you into this art thing. There were some people encouraging you, but there was nobody saying like you got to go do this thing. You went and, and did the research and learned how to do this stuff on your own. Uh, and, and here you are, you're enjoying a, a pretty good career. It's looks, 2012 looks like it's going to be a pretty good year for you. So I'm going to be devil's advocate on the, on the, the uh, anticipating somebody in the audience going, what do you got to be afraid of? What is your deal, dude? Are you neurotic or something? How come you, how come you're experiencing <laughs> fear when you're living the dream after all? Right. Yeah. You know, the initial drive, the initial drive, you know, I applied to art school and I remember when I got in, I had to tell my parents, Look, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be a doctor. I'm gonna go to dental school, and it was on my graduation day at college, and and I I was terrified. I said I don't know how I'm gonna tell this to my father. <laughs> He's going to crap all over my dreams. Uh, but I said, you know what? Regardless of his decision, if I have to pay for art school myself and I have to be hundreds and thousands of dollars in debt, so be it. Because I really want to do this. Um, oh man, I know everybody in the chat just stood up and saluted you. <laughs> I told my dad and. You will be surprised. Like, literally, he looked at me and he said, okay, then I guess you're not going to dental school. And it blew my mind. It was one of those wow. fight or flight situations where you're, <laughs> your fists are clenched and you're having dinner, the graduation dinner, and you're holding up the fork. You're like, I'm not afraid of you anymore, old man. <laughs> um, but no, my dad just said, okay, well, tell me about this school. And I told him about the Art Center College of Design. And my mom was thrilled because I'm an only child and said, oh, it's in Pasadena. You can come home. You can live at home and go to art school. And I said, that, that will be a cold day in hell. I will never do that. I love you, Mom. Um, <laughs> so you sweetened the pill a little bit with that. Yeah. So our, our college was the first art education I'd gotten anywhere. And I went to Art Center. It, it was, I, oh, oh, Dan, we're losing you a little bit. Hold on a second. Okay. Let's see if we give the stream a second to buffer while I vamp, and uh, I, I think the video can't keep up with your gesticulating. You're just too excited. Okay, got it. Uh, no, no, I, I, it's also just it's just a stream issue. It's it's uh, Skype is having trouble. Black, keep... black hat, be a floating head. <laughs> I wonder if we need to reconnect or something because this is this it, you're coming in really fuzzy all of a sudden. Uh, so how about um, you you uh, hang up and call me back real quick, and we'll see if we can get a better connection. Sure. All right, do it right now. And I will I will go ahead while Dan is calling back, and I will read some of the excellent things people are posting on the uh, Google Plus uh, post that I did, asking people for input on this. Uh, oh, here we go. And Matt's ba- <laughs> Dan's back already. Let me see if I can get my mouse to work. Matt, let go of the mouse for crying out loud. Oh, no, no, I had it upside down. That was my fault. I was doing my best. Sorry. No, Matt, you did fine. Sorry about that. I'm blaming you for something that I shouldn't have. Accept, please. Oh. Hey there. Hey there, Dan. Can you see me? I'm trying to see you. Matt, let go of the mouse again because I need to hit the accept button. Oh, there we go. Uh, uh, uh. We get to blame oh. Al for that one. Okay. Oh, okay. So this, this time it was Al's fault in the production room. How come I can't see the video? Can't see me? Oh, here we go. There you are. You're back, and we got a better connection now. So we'll see. Oh, nice. Slight delay, slight, slight interruption in the in the conversation, but 
Okay, so Matt's stealing the mouse back, and we can get back to our discussion about where we're going. So graduation dinner. Mom says, oh, you're in Pasadena, so you get to visit. And uh, so you got to go to art school. Oh, and I lost him again. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so while we try to get him back. I'm sorry about that. No, not your fault. Not your fault. This is, this is the wonders of Skype. Uh, she could For be some reason, I can't see you, but... I will turn on my camera. Oh, gotcha. And then we can see each other again. There we go. Uh, hey, Dan, how you doing? Very good. <laughs> All is right with the world. Yes. So, okay. I'm, like pawing at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is just keeping it real. This is keeping it real, this, this yeah. kind of like technical yes. difficulty. So, okay. Now, where were we? You were at dinner. You, d you didn't have to stab yeah, your dad with the dinner, a dinner. I told my dad about art school. He instantly supported me, which blew my mind. And then at the same time, like, it was beaming. Like, I was beaming with pride about my dad. Like, he, he wants me to be happy. It was never about making me follow in his footsteps and following his legacy. It was, I just, medicine is all I know. And if you need to be a doctor, I can give you every tool imaginable to help you become that. And, you know, he's happy being a doctor. And I, I guess he just wanted me to understand that he's happy because of money. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, I... I think what really helped was I, I, I immediately brought out the pamphlets and the newspaper articles saying, oh, look, you can make $100,000 designing websites. And he said, oh, OK. So I went to art school and, and I attacked art school with this ferocity of, you know, I, it was a couple of things. I wanted to prove my parents that I could do this. And then the second was, and I don't feel like a lot of art students are aware of this, but, you know, you look out in the world. And there's an insanely huge number of talented artists. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, why, you know, why, why should I drink the, the art school punch of, well, if you go to Art Center, you will make a six-figure salary because the degree at Art Center is worth its weight in gold. I, I just didn't buy that, you know. And you hear that from a lot of art schools saying, if you go here, you're the best of the best. And it's like, well, sure. I mean... Maybe I'll get a valuable education, but, I, I, but, you know, there are plenty of amazingly talented artists out there that never went to art school, and, you know, they, they do very well. And so I don't want to say I was competitive in art school, but I did not want to um, – I didn't want to take advantage – like, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to cheapen my experience by doing anything half-assed. Um, and so, you know, when I came out of art school, I actually had three different portfolios because I, did, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I, I had an entertainment portfolio, I had a graphic design portfolio, and then an editorial illustration portfolio. And it might have been, you know, in part to, you know, the, the different teachers that I had, you know. And one of, one of my favorite teachers at art school, he actually, he actually went around the classroom and he was asking every, every student, like, well, what, what do you want to get out of this art school? Like, what do you want to do after you graduate? And he went around the room and someone said, I want to be a background painter at Pixar. I want to be a character designer at DreamWorks. I want to uh, create storyboards for Nickelodeon. I want to do this. And he stopped the class and he said, you know, you guys are paying $100,000 for this education. This education that can make you a well-equipped well artist for any field that you want. And you guys choose to paint backgrounds for a living with this immense, very expensive talent, you know? And, and he just didn't understand that. And, he, and it, it got me thinking, you know, because he also said things like, well, do you, want, do you want to work for the name of a company? Do you want to make a product that you contributed? Or do you want to, do you want to bring some degree of... Uh, notoriety to your name? Do you want to put your own imprint on the world with things that you created from scratch? And, and it got me thinking and I thought, I thought the latter. You know, I said, I, I think I have stories to tell and I want to tell them. And, and in art school, I was trying to do the computer animation thing. And I, I remember I took my first, you know, uh, Maya class and I tried to make a one-minute animated film 
took me 10 weeks and I hated the experience. Like when you open a software package, when you open a 3D software package, it's like grabbing an encyclopedia off the shelf and just looking through the J section. And you just need to know enough to make boxes and spheres. But there's all these, there's all these other dials and numbers yeah. that you have no idea what they do. And you think to yourself, why did they make it so complex? And it was just like, it was, it was something that I just didn't want to get involved in. I said, there has to be a better way to tell stories. And so uh, I, I, I took the children's book course there, which was, um, it was taught by this great teacher. Her name was Deborah Lattimore. And, um, you know, she had this great, very optimistic view of children's books, you know, and she was always painting it in this very dazzling light, like, oh, when you do a book signing, you have to, you have to invite me and bring lots of snacks. <laughs> Um, but it, the course was very straightforward. It's, you know, you make a dummy book, you, uh, send an inquiry letter to an editor, you wait to hear from the editor and then, um, and then they say yay or nay. And it just seemed like it would be more feasible for me to get a book published than to say, get my own cartoon show. Um, so I graduated from art school and the first job I got, I got working at a video game company. I worked at Treyarch which was a division of Activision. They make the, they make the modern warfare games now. Mm. Um, and I was there for six years. Uh, a year out of art school, I got my first two book deal from uh, Arthur Levine Books at Scholastic. Um, and it was one of these Cinderella stories. People ask me, like, oh, how did you get into the business? <clears throat> and the truth is, I went to this conference and I put my portfolio in the illustrator's portfolio preview and I had a dummy book for one of my first uh, picture books and Arthur Levine you know Arthur Levine for those who don't know Arthur Levine's the editor of Harry Potter and um, you know right after the right after the portfolio display this guy comes up with my portfolio and my dummy book and he says I I want to work with you I want to I want to publish this and I thought wow that that was that was pretty. That was pretty sudden. You know? <laughs> um, did he identify what the quality was that made him make that 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 snap decision? Because I want to back uh, up a second. I want to I want to identify some some stuff that you were <laughs> saying here. Uh, it sounds like throughout your experience, you were quickly I, like holding up what was being presented to you versus what your gut was telling you that you wanted to do. Uh -huh. Right. So like, okay, I'm going to try computer animation. That sounds interesting. Oh, mm -hmm. this doesn't fill me with satisfaction. Drop <clears> it. Just let it go. I mean, that's you sound like a pretty courageous and focused guy for the most part. I mean, it doesn't sound like you were full of, of anxiety as you were encountering all these different decisions. Oh no, I was I was totally filled with anxiety. It was uh, the 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 struggle with me, especially in art school, and I think a lot of people have in art school is when you come out when you come out of art school. I think you have to have you have to have a plan. You have to know where you want to go. Um, uh, again, like I said, the insecurity lies in the fact that when I came out of art school, I had three portfolios. I didn't know what to do. I just wanted to grab whatever I could. But I knew that the, the top priority in my career was that I wanted to get into children's publishing. Um, and really, the video game job was, you know, I want this job so that my parents won't get on my back saying like, oh, why did we let them go to art school, you know? Hey, you know, a month out of art school, I got a job at a video game company pays very well. Leave me alone. Okay. Yeah. Like I got this. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, but when I was in art school, the biggest, the biggest concern of mine was, um, can I, can I make a living doing this? Can I, can I pay the bills? And so it's just, you know, it, it's that, and you it's have that kids now and that is that, Having it's that fear in you that makes you make three portfolios where everybody else makes one. Yeah, well, and, and this has been compounded in your adult life with uh, having a family. That's got to put the fear of God in you to uh, yes. get, get some yes. work done and get it sold. 
Uh, I want to I want to back up here real quick. Jake Parker's in the chat, and he's asking uh, Jake Parker of Agent44.com. He's been on the show before, actually. Jake everybody. Parker. Jake Parker. He's he's no small man, chance. That's a man. Uh, uh, last New York heard... Times best selling Jake Parker. That's right. That's right. We have <laughs> to say that you cannot introduce him otherwise, Mr. Jake Parker on the Twitters. <laughs> and uh, I hear rumors that he's starting up a, a comics roundtable, or rather, a, a storytelling roundtable podcast with uh, Scott Young. <laughs> I'm very excited to hear more about that. But he's asking outside of art instruction, what did you benefit from most by going to art school outside of the actual just instruction part oh are you there did i lose you oh no you're there okay oh, I'm here. oh um what did i what did i get most from art school uh, you know i do get this feeling like if 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 an artist were to teach themselves they could teach they could learn the same things that i did but when you go to art school it's at it's at a very accelerated rate and you get surrounded by peers who are also like extremely talented. I've been I've been surrounded by guys who've gone on to do amazing things. And you know, you feed off of each other. You kind of you look at what other people are doing and it inspires you. And um it's it's funny that it's funny about that question because when I was going to when I was going to art center, uh, a semester tuition was going on about 10,000 a semester and there's eight semesters. Oh my gosh. Um and now it's $16,000 a semester. Oh my gosh, forget it. We need we need student loan reform everybody. <laughs> and so I get a lot of I get a lot of emails from people asking me should I go to art school? Should I get my degree? And as much as Art Center has helped me, I honestly can't I can't justify telling people to go there. And basically, when you're done with that education, you have you have a mortgage on a home. Well, yeah, that that's yeah. A friend of mine, Rob Stenzinger of uh, Interactive-Storyteller.com, once said that it, these days, with the price of tuition, in order to get a degree in anything, you have to become an indentured servant after that, right? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. You you are essentially taking out a second mortgage. Uh, you could spend easily one hundred <laughs> one hundred twenty thousand dollars on an education nowadays. That is just outrageous. Uh, yeah. Not to say the teachers are overpaid. Don't teachers don't get mad oh, at me. I'm not a teacher. At, not at art center, no. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, pretty crazy. But I want to get I want to keep digging at this fear thing um, because you wrote this blog post back in December where you talked about how uh, being uh, worried and being afraid and, and really like uh, having that hunger and that chasing after things. Uh, it, it, it changed the way that you were experiencing your career because good stuff was happening, right? You were working the video game job. You got, you got a, a, a deal with Disney to do a cartoon series, The Replacements. That's a dream job. Uh, and it, I remember that you wrote something in the blog post, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I don't know. Um, that you, you, you found yourself missing out on actually experiencing and enjoying those things because you were so worried about the next thing that you had to yeah. take on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um you know, being at the game company, you, you really kind of resent. I mean, there were certain things that I resented about working at the game company, being that, you know, you would be directed by uh, an art director who didn't know how to draw, or you'd be um, managed by an executive producer that was horrible at managing time. And, you know, it's, video game industry is notorious for, you know, crunching. And, you know, my wife never got to see me because I'd have to you know, do four or five months working weekends. Oh, and wow. it was it was this life that I didn't want to have. And strangely enough, I felt doing freelance, regardless of financial security, was going to be better for me because I wouldn't be so stressed about trying to serve someone who needs to get a product done, regardless of how well they manage it. So... Mm -hmm. It's funny because I, I used to talk to art art teachers who said, you know, don't get a job because you're going to fall in love with the money and then you'll never pursue, you know, your own passions. Whereas the opposite happened to me. And I uh, I went and got a full-time job and I resented it so much that I it pushed me harder to do freelance. And so now getting into the video game job about a year or two into the game job, and getting my getting my book deal, getting it out there, and getting it published, you know, Hollywood starts coming in, uh, and agents come by and they say, you know, we we like we like the book that you saw. We'd love to represent you, and uh, and I went with this great agency here in L.A. And then they started 
having me pitch show ideas to uh, you know animation networks. And the replacements was a picture book idea that I wanted to do. Um, and uh, I, I hate again, I hate to I hate to say this, but the replacements was the first show that I ever pitched, and it was my second pitch mo- meeting that sold the show. I went to Nickelodeon and they already had something similar to it, which was the X's at the time. And then I pitched to Disney and then they they had picked it up. And then a year later it got greenlit and here I am, I have a show. Um but you know what's great about that story? And I mean, because like here you are like, <laughs> almost apologizing for it and nobody should apologize for their and not. I'm not saying you were. I'm saying it almost. Uh, but nobody should apologize for being successful or, or doing a good job at something. But uh, it just goes to show that there's no escape from this. Right. There's always it's like the sunshine today, uh, but it's it's, it's sunnier <laughs> over there. You know, it's like there's yeah. always somebody who's going to have it better than you. And if you are uh, it's like it's like whenever. I'm victim of this one, and I don't know if you are. Maybe some folks in the chat can back me up if, if this is, or maybe I'm just petty. But like, I'll read like a blog post about somebody who's doing like a re- having a really good time at something, right? It's like oh, somebody's experiencing all this great success, and I'm like, man, I should be doing that. They, you know, they, they're doing so well with this. I gotta be doing that too because I, I'm running out of time. I only got 50 years left it, at best, you know, uh, to to yeah. do all the stuff I want to do, and I want to be successful like that too. Um, and, and then I have to stop and remind myself that. You know, uh, you're not enjoying what you're doing now if you're always looking at what somebody else is doing, right? And, and yeah. what's more is no matter how good it is, landing a job at Disney, it, <laughs> it still didn't make it any easier for you, did it? Because you were working the video game job while you did the replacements too, right? Yeah, I was working full-time at the game company, and then I was working on the replacements, and then I was still freelancing at home. And you, you know what happens is that when you buy a house, the first thing that, that fills your mind is, I have to be able to pay for this house. <laughs> then my wife, my wife got pregnant, and then the first thing in your mind is, I have to start saving for college right now. I have to be able to pay for this thing. Yeah. And so I think it was, again, I think it was my parents saying, money will take care of everything. And I didn't want to let go. I didn't want to let go of the video game job because I thought, what if the cartoon show only lasts one season? Then what? And then... Um, so the entire first season of the replacements, I was still at the video game job. And then when there was a meeting in Burbank, I would be gone for like a two-hour lunch because I'd have to go drive all the way from Santa Monica to Burbank, go to this meeting, and then leave immediately and go back to, to the game company and, you know, oh, where were you? Oh, I had diarrhea. <laughs> oh, well, you had diarrhea, so obviously you're telling the truth because no one would ever claim that. Um, <laughs> that that does work. I called in sick for work once when I wasn't sick, and uh, you just say that. And they're like, "Oh, nobody would say that." Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, but it was I was just running around, just you know, uh, trying to try, trying to keep all these things going because I, I was afraid of losing it all. Yeah. Um. And and then you know, and then what happened? I think the biggest turning point was when I had my first son. And you know when you have a when you have a a newborn child, they wake up every two three hours and they have to eat. And um, for me, like my daily routine was, I would wake up, uh, I would take my young kid to like you know infant daycare, and then I'd head off to work at ten in the morning, and then I would leave the game job at seven, and I would go to Disney until ten, sometimes midnight, and then I would come home. And then I would work on my freelance stuff till maybe two, three in the morning. And then I would go to sleep. And that's where that's where having a kid caught up to you because he would probably wake you up in that small window of time that you had that, to sleep. That very critical window of sleep, yeah. yeah. And honestly, for for a good for a good year and a half, I was averaging maybe three hours of sleep, just because I was so worried that I was going to lose all this stuff, and I would lose my house, and I would lose, you know, you know, my my I wouldn't be able to pay for college for my kid, who's only like eight months old. <laughs> uh, and so that was always the driving motivation. Meanwhile, you know, the game company was working on uh, Spider Man Three, the movie game, mm-hmm. and it was just, uh, like I, I didn't have any fun working on that at all. And while I was at Disney, 
it, it's not so much about me creating a show, but pleasing the executives who want to, you know, get a certain rating for a certain demographic. And so you come up with all these ideas and they, and an executive always has to put their hand on it, you know, like, no, it should be this. No, it should be that. And there was this really huge buildup of insecurity in myself thinking, you know what? I don't know how to tell stories anymore. I don't know how to, I don't know how to, you know, draw anything anymore because I'm always getting notes that it's wrong. And, oh, uh, man. Yeah. When, when a committee tries to committee your story out of existence, right? Yeah. And this thing where I'm always like, I was always, I was always trying to please everybody, you know? And the last person I was trying to please with myself. You know, and so with the with the freelance with the freelance illustration of picture books, my first pi- my first picture book came out, and you know I'll, I'll be honest, the, the reviews were so so, and I'm really sensitive to like to like criticism, where you know I'm not I'm not angry, but you know, but you get hurt. You get hurt when you read something. Of course. Yeah, you go on, like Goodreads is my enemy, and I go to Goodreads and I read reviews, <laughs> and it's you know most of the reviews. The good portion of the reviews for sidekicks, you know, are favorable. Yeah. Um, then you'll say, oh, this book was great. Three stars. Well, why was it just three stars? <laughs> you know? And then you kind of, after a while, you realize, oh, three stars just means that they liked it a lot. But, you know, they would have given, like, their favorite book four stars. Because there's no such thing as anything perfect, you know? Con- conversely, Dan, I'm curious, are you suspicious when you see four or five stars? Do, do you do you go like, hey, wait a second, were they just doing that because uh, <laughs> they like me or because they, you know, they, uh, it's like it's like the Groucho Marx thing. I won't be part of any club that'll have me. You know, uh, it's like I I personally oscillate between that. It's like I'm I'm the guy who goes, why three? Hey, it should have been four. But then when I get four, I'm like, hey, wait a second, why are you giving me four? What's what's really going on here? Are you stupid? I just it, it's um. I you know I don't I don't try to question those four five star reviews. I just think you're awesome. Thanks so much. And then you realize, oh, that one guy that came in and trolled and gave me one star, two stars. It takes like five, six, you know, five star reviews just to raise that by point one. Like, oh, that's good. That one troll ruined everything. And you know, it's uh, it, again, it's this thing where. Um, just, I don't know why I'm such a victim to reviews. Like, I just want to make sure. I just want to know that what I do is a good job, and that. It, and you're it, pouring your guts into it, right? You, you know, yeah. this it's like you're talking about. You talked about when you were on the replacements. You were pleasing a committee. You were pleasing executives. And then when you're doing the children's book or like the graphic novel, like Sidekicks, this is pleasing yourself, and which has a certain kind of satisfaction. You finish the book, you look at it, you get to hold it, and you probably walk <laughs> around the house with it for a little while. Like I, yeah. I know I did. Uh, and you know, you just keep looking. Oh, I did a book, and then you want people to enjoy that book because this is. I gave I gave my copy of my first graphic novel to my mother, and I said, "Mom, this is my soul on paper. This is five years of my life on paper." Because I, I poured yeah. everything I had into it, and she went, "That's great," and threw it in the trunk of her car. And I went, "Oh, it just crushed me." I mean, I know yeah. she didn't mean anything by it. You know, it's like like she she, she was happy for me and everything, but she didn't realize the how much that meant to me. Because and all this story is trying to say is that. Man, we pour our guts into this stuff, and so of course it's going to be hard for us to take criticism and reviews, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. My parents, my parents are guilty of the same thing. You know, like <laughs> uh, it's it's. Um, I don't to this day. I don't even think my parents read Sidekicks yet. But you know, they. Yeah. My dad, <laughs> my dad will look at Sidekicks and say, "Oh." Uh, you would have probably done better if you had more yellow in it. Like, thank you, two cents, old man. More yellow in it. You're absurd. Good day, sir. Yeah, good day, sir. Um, it, it's it's um, but in, in terms of in terms of talking about fear, you know, I want the biggest I- fear. The biggest fear was kind of I think taking that next step and relying on my own abilities to uh, take care of myself and not rely on a big company to finance me. But that I was so disgusted with working at a game company, and I was so disgusted at working at Disney that it pushed me to this point where I was willing to fall on my own sword if if you know if things didn't work out. I said, it, you know. Hell or high water. If I if I if I succeed, if I fail, at least it'll be on my own terms. And I and I just I you know I left the game company. Actually, to be to be quite honest, 
my, my friend was the art director at the game company, and I had to ask him to lay me off. They were doing a round of layoffs, and I had to ask him to lay me off because I said, if you don't lay me off, I don't think I'll have the courage to quit. Yeah. So you have to do it for me. And he kind of looked at me and he said, you know, I was waiting for you to just leave this job because you have so many other things going. And I thought, why are you still here working with us, being miserable with the rest of us? And so. Oh, man, what you're pointing to is another thing that I hear young artists talk about. And I, I was guilty of this myself when I was in my 20s. Uh, there's this, this impression we get in our heads that. Once I score X job, oh, man, when I get a series at Disney, when I get my first children's book, then I'm set. The jobs are just going to start coming in, and I'm going to have more and more opportunities, and I'm not going to have to struggle so hard at this thing anymore. Uh, A story that I love to tell is something my wife once said. She said when she was eight years old, she thought she'd wake up one morning as an adult and say, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, or whatever, I decided, and I'm not going to think about it anymore. That's like the kid's view of adulthood. You're just set. You You are fully formed, and you don't have to worry about this stuff. Uh, and here you are with all the success and all these things going on, but yet it was terrifying to give up the regular gig. And that's another yeah. thing that I think is a great story to tell people who are interested in this this cartooning biz as well as people who are in the cartooning biz and are struggling with this fear is that that fear never goes away, right? It never does. It never does. It's, it's um, you know, working at Disney, it, it just it, – if, if anything, working for a place and just being governed by too many chiefs, if you will – it, it it just constantly makes you second guess yourself and you'll be miserable. I mean, working at a place like Treyarch, working at a video game company, every day you just get this thing dangled over your head saying, if you don't do this job, we'll always find someone to replace you. Yeah. If you work in freelance, the only person you can blame is yourself. So you're putting your heart into everything. Oh man, and yeah. If results, yeah. If results come from it, then you've done your, you know, you've you've done a good job. If if not, then you didn't work hard enough. But strangely enough, I've actually felt more job security being a freelancer than I ever did working a full time job. And it's because I don't, I'm not constantly being threatened by anybody. Yeah, Merlin yeah. Man, Merlin Man once said, uh, you know, once you start working for yourself. Uh, you will be surprised at how hard you work because the because once you've had a taste of being your own boss, you are so uh, terrified of the notion of having to do that for somebody else that you'll yeah. find yourself working three times, four times as hard because I'm not going back to that if I can help it. I do. Uh, that's my motivation now. Yeah. Like now, my motivation is I don't want to have to get a job. I like I like working in my studio. I like, you know, you got a chalkboard wall behind you. I mean, exactly. that's <laughs> I can I can play Mass Effect if I want to right now, you know. It's, but you it's, won't because you're deadlining, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, it's it's hard work and there's a lot of discipline involved, but um, you know, you help the time pass by working on your Photoshop file on one side and watching, you know, community or, you know, Netflix on the other half of that screen and time just flies, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's not something that you would probably be able to do so much at a nine to five job. I love being my own boss, not because, you know, not because, uh, you know, I get to, well, yeah, I mean, I get to call the shots. I mean, really when you work in publishing, it's you, an editor, an art director, that's it. You know, and it, it just helps. It helps keep the vision of your product nice and pure. Um, and I think there's probably I've heard this from some people that there might be this misnomer that, um, oh, you know, an editor is going to tell you how to tell your story. And that's not that's not the case. What happens is they well, in children's publishing, I should say, they'll ask you, what is it that you want to say in this story? And you tell them what the message is, and they'll read it, and they'll say, that's not what it's saying. Try to work on that because it's not clear. And that's all it is. It's just, you know, it's hurting you in the right direction. And that's all, you know, I love to figure my own, my own things out. And when I, when I do books now, I prefer doing all the design and all the typography. I like to just have 100% control of it because, you know, not because I'm vain, but because I just feel as a product – if there's that seamlessness between the art and the design, it just makes a stronger product. And, I'm, and that's all I'm really about. I'm really about making the best thing that I can. The, one of the funny things when I think about artists who throw the vanity word at each other, 
uh, is ultimately, I mean, I, I work in comics, so uh, one of the things that I'd like to tell people is, uh, is that the great thing about comics is you can be kind of famous, but not really famous at all. I can go to the grocery store, and I'm, I'm world famous to like 300 people, but I can go to the grocery store and not be recognized. But even if I was like super famous, you know, even if I was like a big hot artist, I could go to the grocery store and not have to worry about people trying to get at me. Uh, what, yeah. I'm, what I'm going with this is, is that... This says this book says Dan Santat on it, and it's a Dan Santat production. It's got all of your topography. It's got all, you've thumbprinted everything in this book. Uh, ultimately, that doesn't mean that the general public is going to go, "Oh, look, look, that's him, that's him." You see him? He's coming. It's Dan Santat. Yeah. You know, it's it's like it, it's it, you can't throw the vanity word at it. It's because ultimately, uh, illustrators and comic book artists and etc ultimately don't really have what anybody would call fame it's it, it, it has to be a, a quality control issue right it's you want at, yeah at this point in my career you know I, I think one of my personal goals in in, in my profession is I, I just I, I again it's it's this thing where I should really just be concerned with pleasing myself but there is something about wanting to be uh, admired by your peers like you want to know that you can run with the pack that oh, you're not yeah. just half it's like, oh yeah, that guy. You know, you yeah. want you want to have people that you admire greatly say, like, oh, I I admire your work also. You know, I think every artist has that has that in them to want to know that they have some kind of validation in the work that they do. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I'll hear it from people like, oh, I don't care what anybody thinks of my work. I just do it. You know, and I th and I think to myself, you're. I think you're kind of full of crap. You know? <laughs> you're you're sharing something that's personal. Uh, I, it's hard for me to swallow that pill that somebody's doing it without any sense of who's reading it or why. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. I'll accept it as a possibility, but I've yet to meet somebody who says really with any kind of sense of sincere honesty that I don't care what anybody thinks. I just do it. If that's the case, why are you sharing it? Why are you tweeting about it? Right. Um, I want to. We're getting cl toward the end, and I want to close with some thoughts on uh, another thing that came to mind as I was investigating this idea of fear. And I want to get your thoughts on this because I hear this a lot from people. I, I teach a lot of comics workshops and classes, and I'll see cartoonists, young cartoonists, <coughs> beginning cartoonists, who just refuse to finish a product or a project. Um, they got a couple pages in. They're reworking it, reworking it. And I say, just just get to the end. Get to the end and finish the thing. And they say, uh, it's got to be perfect. And sometimes I, and, and somebody's going to be here listening to you going like, wow, this guy focuses on his quality control. He really cares about it. He's a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. But there's perfectionism and perfectionism, right? I mean, I'm wondering if you could speak to this student who says like, oh, uh, uh, I, I can't release it. I can't share it. I can't finish it until it's right. Uh, perfectionism as a means to... Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It, it kind of goes back to, um, and and I think this this was a lesson that I learned in art school, where um, when you go to art school, there's always like a pack of people that are obsessed with drawing the perfect nude figure, and they never get past that point. They just need to be able to draw the best elbows or hands, or you know, they need to get that perfect figure down, yeah. and you know, you quickly learn that that's never going to be attained. Like, you're never going to be able to draw that. And I saw a lot of people who they never they never got over that idea of, you know, in order to be a great artist that you had to draw the perfect figure. And by the time they graduated from art school, all they had was a portfolio full of naked people, you know. <laughs> and then when it was time to get a job, you know, like you'd go – <laughs> apply to some place like Nickelodeon and it's like, well, we do SpongeBob. <laughs> we have a portfolio full of naked dudes. Right. And, and um it, it's it's the it's the it's the thought of a person looking at the pebble and not the whole beach. Mm. And so I know that I know that, you know, the stories that I that I do aren't going to be loved by everyone. Um and I know that Given you know the opportunities that I've had, I I also can't sit and obsess about what other people would do, because the thing that I learned quickly in freelance work is if you're not true to yourself, 
you're you're actually not going to you're not going to do well. And what I mean by that is, a, a, a lot of artists they'll go they'll go to art school, and one of the first things they do upon graduation is they'll look at their portfolio, and they'll say, "Can I sell this? Can I make a living doing this?" And when you do that, you end up being dictated by the money. You know, you're not you're not trying to draw the way you draw. Chances are you're probably looking at an artist who's been successful over the years, and you're saying, if I if I incorporate some of the attributes of that person's style and adopt it into mine, then I should be just as successful as that person. Yeah. And it never happens. You end up doing a bastardization of a product, and you just end up being that guy who just draws like that guy. But why would they hire you if they can just hire that guy? Um. And and I and I did I did a post about finding your own style because that's one of the big things that they talk about in art school saying you know if you really want to make it in this world you have to find your art style and my advice to everybody is don't try to look for it when I when I kind of came out of art school I had to start a portfolio all over again because my work was all over the place and I would come back from the game company I would go to my studio and I would just sit with a blank slate. And I said, I'm going to paint something, and I'm not going to stop painting this until I'm proud enough to hang it on my own wall. And 10 weeks later, I had 10 new pieces, and that pretty much defined my style. I didn't have any artwork that influenced me anywhere. I just looked at the canvas, and I painted it, and I relied on my own judgment saying, what does this need? What is it lacking? And really, going to art school is just part of it. Being able to trust your own instincts and refining them until you yourself are confident in your work and saying that what you do is good enough is what's going to take you to that next level. It sounds really corny, really zen, but it, it's the truth. Like if you don't have faith in what you're doing, then why would anybody else? To that point, and and sort of like to rope in some book recommendations into this episode, I brought something that uh, was related to our whole talk. Um, this is a book, uh, 18 Minutes by Peter Bregman, and I'll hold it up for the camera. Uh, and let's see, this came out last year, September of 2011, this came out. And it's a series of essays, it's kind of like in the same vein as uh, Stephen Pressfield's The uh, War of Art. Uh, <laughs> okay. <coughs> And there's a whole section in here on perfectionism, and one of the things that he says in this book that I thought was really uh, insightful was that the world doesn't reward perfection, it rewards productivity. And <coughs> if you're stopping yourself from actually producing something because you're waiting for it to be perfect, or you're trying to ape somebody else, or you're trying to mimic something else that seems to be selling, and not just doing the work, then you know, you're, you're never going to get gigs. Uh, the, I started getting attention from my work and, and got some of my first publishing gigs by just doing the work that I was enjoying doing and having a fun time. Ironically enough, uh, it was while I was working on a book called The Replacements. Uh, it was a webcomic okay. I was doing uh, back in 2003, 2004, 2005. And uh, a publisher just kind of just saw the, the, the webcomic and then emailed me and the person I was working on with is Sarah Turner of cricket-press.com and said, uh, we love this comic. Please do that for us and we'll pay you. And, you know, it was work for hire. It was freelance work, but it was on our own terms where they just wanted us to do it our way and just write yeah. a brand new story in that style, which was made it the most fun job ever. And yeah. that would, wouldn't have happened had we not just shared the stuff that we just enjoyed doing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, replacements took seven years because not not replacements. Sidekicks took seven years because after my first book came out, and it came out with the lukewarm warm reviews, I think I was just really uh, scared to be hurt by the criticism. And I, I really I sat back for years just illustrating other people's manuscripts and letting them put their souls on paper, and I would just supplement with the pretty pictures. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that so that I wouldn't be the victim of the criticism for the story. Oh man, that is a and big so, one. Oh, yeah. hiding behind somebody else that way. I have done that so many yeah. times. And so it, it's this thing where you know you'd see all your other friends who went into publishing and moving on to doing great things, putting their heart out there and exposing themselves it, that's 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 the whole i guess that's the greener pasture things it's the envy yeah. it's wow why didn't i just stick with this you know like i wasted i don't want to say wasted seven years of my life but you know 
I would be at a different point. I'd probably be on my third graphic novel by now if I just focused on it, you know, if I wasn't so afraid. I wrote this down. You said this earlier. This was very early on the conversation when you're talking about uh, being in the dentist school. Uh, you said uh, you said to yourself, <laughs> I would regret it if I didn't try a career yeah. in art. And now you're talking about regret again. There's nothing worse yeah. than that, right? Yeah. Uh, no, and and no. Nina Crittenden, uh, NV Crittenden on the Twitters uh, posted, you are so admired by your peers, Dan. So th there we go. We were talking about uh, seeking admiration of our peers. So there, you just got it in, tw in Twitter, convenient Twitter form, uh, using the Comics Are Great hashtag. So... Um, we got to wrap this up, uh, and I, I want to respect your time, and, and you know, you, you got work to do, dude, or at least uh, uh, Call of Duty to play, uh, or, yeah, right. or Mass, Mass Effect, Effect 3. Mass Effect 3. <laughs> uh, I haven't Mass Effect 3 because I spent all last year working on books, so Mass Effect 2 was sitting in the wrapper, unopened, and I just cracked it open like two weeks ago. And now I'm in trouble because it's like, no, nah, this is a compelling story. I have to know. <laughs> really. It, it's, it's this binge thing. Like I, I had Red Dead uh, Redemption. And uh, I said to myself, if I start playing this again, I'm, I'm not going to get any work done. And then you get to this point where you're playing the video game and you say, I have to finish this or my, I, my professional career will be destroyed. <laughs> so I played Red Dead Redemption non-stop for a week like my wife oh. would come home how was work oh it was great but i have a long night ahead of me because i was <laughs> working all day she doesn't watch and, this right uh, yeah <laughs> and i finally beat that beast and i said okay i can't touch any more games i have to go back to work that's oh man uh, I'm glad I'm not the only one who suffers with that too. Uh, fortunately, I I am really really bad at video games, so I can play just long enough to get frustrated, and then it's like, okay, I guess I better work. I'd love to find out what happens next in this Metroid game, but I'm so bad at it that it's uh, anyway. <laughs> we, we should we should give you a chance to promote some of the stuff. Are you gonna be doing any appearances soon? Anything? Any places uh, you're gonna be? I will be at the uh, American Library Association conference, the ALA conference in Anaheim, yeah. uh, signing for several several titles. Um, and then I'm also going to be at the LA Times Festival of Books, signing, um, signing, you know, other other titles. Uh, I will be speaking at the Icon Illustrators Conference in June with uh, fellow children's author illustrator Adam Rex. Um, what else do I have this year? This is uh, all at dan dantat.com, right? Yeah. Uh, I have to. It's been a while since I worked on a post. I apologize, but. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm trying to keep it lean and mean because I have a pretty busy year ahead of me in terms of books. Heck yeah. Uh, Just watch that trailer on your website. Holy cow. It's it's absurd <laughs> how many books you got coming out this year. Yeah, that's right. But, but you do school visits? You do uh, talks? I, I'm happy to do school visits. And, and I know budgets are tight for a lot of teachers in schools, so I also do Skype, uh, Skype chats. Um, just email me and inquire about them and... Uh, I'll I'll try to fit you in my schedule. I'm also um, I I also feel obligated to do book trailers for all the books that are coming out this year. So I'll be uh, I'll be busy uh, doing <laughs> filming myself. You know, making a ham of of, of you know, like oh, buy this book. Ooh, dance. <laughs> you, know? you got some pretty great videos on your website too. So people should go to dantat.com after this episode is over. Uh, go there twice and check out all the neat stuff there. And then also, if you got a young person in your life, or if you're young at heart like me, if you enjoy the kids' stories or the stories that are also good for kids, you should check out Sidekicks. Uh, beautifully illustrated story, Dan. So, yep, there it is. Nominated for a Children's Book Choice Award. You can go to That's Book right. Week online and vote for it. What, uh, what's what's Jenny the Holmes, um, Jenny Holmes uh, squished Super Amoeba? It's also nominated in that card. Along with others. Oh, you're uh, you're turning into you're turning so into a, the Skype compression is turning into a robot. So just uh, very slowly, give me that URL again so we can talk about uh, the voting for you for the Children's Book Awards. <laughs> oh, I've totally lost you. I will put it in the show notes. Uh, it's it's totally coming in fuzzy now. But uh, when I will. I will look at your Twitter feed real quick, and I will find that because, uh, oh, come on. I want to view more tweets because I want to find this URL to, t to tell everybody where to go on the audio. Not that people ever write down the URLs in the audio, but, you know, you never know. Okay, so it's bookweekonline.com. 
slash voting slash three dash four is where you can go to vote for sidekicks. Uh, if you are so inclined, help help a help a guy out. If you thought his stuff, everything Dan said today was really interesting and fun, which I did, uh, you could give him a little bit of a pat in the back by going there and voting for it. So uh, lots of people in the chat saying that they had a good time today. So uh, yeah, uh, follow Dan Santat uh, on Twitter at d s a n t a t d Santat, and then dantat.com is the website. Dan, I can't thank you enough for this great conversation today. This was really fun. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And, of course, if we're going to do some quick plugs, <laughs> Dave Roman's Astronaut Academy, Teen Boat. Thank you. It does not be possible without him. That's uh, right. I owe, I owe Dave. Big... Around the World, uh, Jared Krasowska's Lunch Lady series, uh, Raina Telgemeier's Smile, David Small, Stitches, uh, The Unsinkable Walker Bean by Aaron Reiner. Uh, Empire State by Jason Nishiga. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Eric in the Kid. chat. Say same difference. Uh, level up. Level up. Gene Yang. Gene Yang, that's right. Yeah. Who will uh, also be at ALA. New York Times bestselling author Jake Parker's Missile Mouse. Missile Mouse, that's one. Uh, uh, yeah, Eric, Eric already lost track of all of those. Uh, yeah, this is like being in, uh, trying to be uh, uh, a sign language interpreter for the Micro Machine Man. <laughs> uh, but but anyway, yes, uh, D Santat on Twitter. Follow him today. You won't be sorry. And check out his books. And uh, uh, we'll put links to all the things that Dan talked about in the show notes, uh, and as well as the things I talked about. So. Uh, thanks, everybody, for downloading and listening. This episode will be available at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG49, <laughs> or it'll also be available at comics.aadl.org. People in the Southeast Michigan area, do check out comics.aadl.org for updates on uh, upcoming comics workshops, events. Uh, there's stuff going on at the Ann Arbor District Library all the time, the monthly Comics Artist Forum, as well as uh, Skype visits and all sorts of uh, comics workshops. The summer program is, be is uh, upon us. Uh, we're going to have the Comic Book Academy and the Comics Fundamentals courses coming up soon, as well as Kids Read Comics. KidsReadComics.org is coming uh, this July 7th and 8th, 2012, and we've got some pretty exciting people coming to this thing. Um, so you can find out more of that information at comics.aadl.org. So thank you, everybody, once again uh, for participating and downloading. Thanks to Dan Santat. Thanks to uh, Dave Roman of yatime.com for setting this episode up. Dave introduced me to Dan, and I appreciate that. Until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye.